dead to sin and alive to know and serve God. Then we are to act accordingly. So believers are dead to sin and alive to God. If that's the case, then we are to present ourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. And believers are free to serve God rather than sin. Notice you have a choice. You can either serve God or not serve God. There's no in-between. There's no gray area there's no lukewarmness because then Christ will spew you from his mouth. When you hear the word baptize, what does that mean and what does that symbolize to you? Getting rid of the old sin and becoming a new person. Yep. Amen. Anybody else? The Bible says when you're buried, you're buried into Christ and you come up... Uh, in him, uh -huh. new person, sister, sister. Right. Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In Acts 22, 16, it says, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Some don't agree with this, but this is biblical. Baptism will not get you to heaven. You do not have to be baptized to go to heaven. I know many people that have accepted the Lord as their personal Savior and never were able to be physically baptized. They went to heaven. So many people say, oh, you got to be baptized to go to heaven. Where? Show me in the Bible. Show me in the Word of God. All Jesus did was do it as an example. To Basically, it was a showing of the old man being buried, the new man being raised. That's what it is. It's symbolic. It is not the way. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. You have to be born again. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, hey, Nicodemus, you have to be born again and baptized. He never said that. So don't let that hem you up. A lot of people let it hem them up that, oh, if I don't get baptized, I'm not going to heaven. That is not true. As long as you've been born again and you've accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're good. As long as you keep striving to live right and don't walk away from it, you're going to be okay. Because we're not perfect. None of us are. You know, I was brought up in the Church of Christ. <coughs> you know, they're, they're heavy on that. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're instrumental, which we were. We believed in instruments and stuff. Or if you're the other church that doesn't believe in music. Acts two thirty eight was their was their big thing, you know. And the thing about Acts two thirty eight is that was still part of the Old Testament back in that day, until after Jesus, well, even after Jesus died, but they were still preaching the old, you know, like uh, John the Baptist, you know, but. Uh, since I've gotten out of the Church of Christ and, uh, you know, you get into the Word, you realize, just like you said, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Because it just says that, Paul says that uh, when you confess and you accept Christ into your heart, that's when you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And baptism, you can go in you've heard the phrase, you can go in a, a wet center or a center and come out still a center. You know, it's all in the way that you react. I, you know, I'm like you, I don't believe baptism is necessary to be saved, but uh, it's just a matter of understanding the word. If you read into the word further, you'll know that uh, Baptism is just more of a symbolic uh, doing on your part. I mean, I believe everybody should do it that are able. Like I said, there's a lot of people that physically are just not able to do it. I mean, I, I remember when I used to go to Unity, we had a, a gentleman in his 90s. Um, now, we did baptize him, but it took a lot to be able to get him in and out of the, the baptistry because of his health. But he was determined because he wanted he wanted to do it. So we made sure he did it. But I know people that, um, like my, my really good friend Jim that's home with the Lord now, uh, he never got baptized. But I was next to him when he accepted the Lord and saw the change and saw what he did in his life. And um, But he just never was able, with work and everything, to get back in the church and do all that. That didn't keep him out of heaven. I mean, that's a lot of people just... I don't know why they believe that. And we believe in immersion. We don't believe in sprinkling or throwing water on you. Okay? Uh, that's just a waste of water. <laughs> Jesus was submerged all the way and brought back up. That's what we're supposed to do, which we're going to do next Sunday. Um, Lord willing. So, that's it. I mean, it's just one of them things. So many people get caught. We, it was funny. We were yesterday. I was playing golf with um, the head guy that I work with. At, that's at the college there. He's a Christian as well. And a gentleman that 
was my brother-in-law's best friend when he was alive. Uh, they all go to church together, and we were playing golf yesterday and had plenty of time uh, to talk because I guess the love of money, that golf course wanted everybody and their brother to be playing. So that was mm -hmm. five mm -hmm. hours. I'm never it's ridiculous to play golf, but so we talked a lot, and it's sad to see what churches are doing to people within the church, destroying over headly little stuff. Um, he was telling me why he left the church he was at and what the pastor did, and it was a pastor that my wife and friend grew up under, and I'm like, it doesn't surprise me. I felt that a long time ago about him. It's not changed. I mean, we, we got to realize this ain't about us, okay? This is all about Christ and him, crucified, risen from the grave, and what he's done for us and what he's going to do for us. That's what it's about. It's not about, hey, what can I get out of it? Hey, look at me when I come to church. Oh, it's got to be my way or no way. No. And I've told you all here many times, and I said it to them yesterday, and they looked at me like in shock that I said it. But I said, listen, I'm not their shepherd. I was like, I'm their under-shepherd. Because the Bible says the Lord is my shepherd. So that is our shepherd. I was like, he's placed me here just to be a guide to allow him to guide the church through me, but he's got to be over me. But there's a lot of churches that it's that pastor's way or no way, and it's to me that's not a church. Um, and we got to realize the only way that we're gonna succeed in our walk with Christ is to realize one: why did we ever get saved in the first place? Ask yourself that question: Why did you accept Christ as your Savior? What are you doing about it? Because you can't go to you can't be saved by works. We know that. But once you get saved, you're gonna want to work. There's a difference. Once you get that Holy Spirit inside you, you're going to have something inside you that's telling you, come on, let's go do this. Your flesh is like, no, we're not. The Spirit's like, come on now, we got to go do this. Let's get up and read our Bible today. Let's, let's go to church. See, some people don't get excited about going to church. I know we'll get in Sunday school in a second. They, um, <laughs> they get up in the morning and some are like, oh, it's church. Let's go so we can check it off the box. Say we were there. They get there. Oh, I told y'all, church is the greatest Halloween store known to mankind. Because people wear their mask to church every Sunday. And you really know the person on Monday. That's who they really are. Think about it. People come to church too many times and they play church. And then on Monday, you see the who, the real person. I'm just me. Crazy. Fat. I mean, it, it's that, that's me, you know. And I, you t I told y'all know what I love to eat and what I don't like to eat. And pizza. I'm not going to change. I know there's going to be pizza in heaven. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> God said he gives you the desires of the heart. I'm pretty sure he has an oven up there waiting. And a golf course. So it's just one of them things that we, we have to quit making Christianity so complicated when it's not. I mean, so many people want to pick on this little thing. And say, oh, well, you're going to go to hell for doing this while this person's doing this. That's also a sin, but in their eyes it's not. And it's like, go to the one that's allowed to judge you. I'm not. I did not die on the cross for you. I have no right to judge you. All I can do is tell you what the Word of God says. You do what you want with it. And I tell people, be careful how you interpret the Bible. Don't take a scripture from here because they got on the thing yesterday about Jesus turning water into wine. And I just sat there. I just sat there and then I looked at Howard which is the head guy and I says well you know what's funny I just did a study on that well then when I did that the other gentleman I was playing golf with Jake he's like yeah I've done a study on it too and he said there's no reason to get into an argument I said you know one thing I've learned is we're going to agree to disagree and still love one another Amen. I said because in the end you're going to stand before God by yourself I'm going to stand before God by myself we're all going to give an account for what we believe and why we believe it, right or wrong. So I tell people, read the Word of God for what it says, not what you want it to say, okay? Because God's Word will cut you, and it will hurt at times if you allow it to do what it's intended to do, and that's to draw each and every one of us closer to Christ. That's God's whole mission. He loves us that much that he wants each and every one of us to be as close to him as we can. And quit getting all these little petty little arguments amongst one another and, and this church and that church. and it, it's, it's so childish, if you ask me, 
that so many people want to just look at other people. When we're supposed to be a church of, uh, God's church is supposed to be a church that heals, you know, a church that helps people. This is like a God's American Red Cross is what the church is supposed to be. But many won't come to church today because it destroys people when it's supposed to uplift and build people back mm -hmm. up. And you know just as well as I do, there's, in, well, this was, what, 15 years ago when I read this statistic. They said out of the Baptists, there's over 250 different denominations of Baptists. 250. I don't get it. What all that caused from? This one got mad at this one, so this one left and started this church. This one got mad at this one, this one left and started this church. I'm telling y'all, there are going to be some sad people when they get to heaven and they don't see their church name on one of those 12 gates. They're going to be mad. <laughs> Whoa, it's supposed to say our church's name to go through heaven. They're going to be mad. You think I'm kidding? There's so many people that just feel like if you're not part of that, you're going straight to hell. It's like, what? So I, I just tell people, I was like, we don't need to make this complicated. All we need to do is be Jesus to somebody. Don't act like Jesus. If you look up that word act in the dictionary, it says hypocrite. <laughs> look at the actors. Granted, most of them live the same way that they act, but the Bible says to be Jesus to people. Show them love. Show them compassion. And the hardest thing for us to do is show them forgiveness. Trust me, it's not easy when you're staring at them with a smile and you want to choke them and you can't because God won't let you. But you can ask him to do it. <laughs> Vengeance is the Lord's, not ours. And uh, it's on your heart, so go ahead and tell him because you know you can't lie to God and say, I didn't feel that way. Yeah, you did. <laughs> You're looking at him with that smile, just thinking, putting your hand, you know, you, you can't do that, though. Because just think, it could have been done to us. And don't ever think, and I know we're fixing to get into it, don't ever think <laughs> that, oh, I'm glad that ain't me. Because it could be. You could easily fall right into what that person is either doing or saying. When we think that we're better than they are, be careful that fall's coming. And the Bible says it's a great fall. Because pride, God does not like. And um, so we just got to love people, you know. And it's like I told y'all Chase um, resigned from his church, which, which is sad. Um, that church is being destroyed by a family in that church that is running that church. And... We went and played golf Friday, and it is sad to see what people do to other Christians. Text messages being sent out, emails being sent out, all lies. And it's like, but his deacon said one thing on Sunday to him, and the next day he sends out these texts and emails of people within the church saying something totally different. I'm telling you, there's evil in churches. Y'all think I'm kidding. There's, there's some ungodly people in churches that are there for one reason, one reason only. They're working for Satan and they're gonna to try to destroy what they can. That they call it, was it, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing? But you gotta also realize that Jesus promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against this church. Do you realize we are the church, not this building? We are the church. So we gotta realize God is going to take care of us. He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. He's going to supply every one of our needs, not your wants. If he does your wants, it's because he loves you that much. He's only told to do our needs. So just realize that God loves you. Don't listen to ne negativity. Don't be around negativity. Remember what we learned on Wednesday? If you're around it, you end up becoming it. You know, it keeps rubbing off on you because that's what the enemy wants you to do and it wants to keep you that way. So just think about it. Who do you represent? And, I, and I'll leave you with this as we get ready to read in Romans. When somebody looks at you, can they tell that you are a Christian or do you have to tell them? Because if you have to tell them, then you're not doing your job. They should see something in you, one, that's different, two, that they want. You know, they should see something in you that they don't have that they would like to have. So that's one thing we have to realize, that we have to make sure we are portraying Christ. And the only way we can do this, whatever chains you down from being able to live for Christ, let him break those chains. Good.
who see something in you that they hate you. Because Jesus said, I came to bring the sword. He said, I didn't come to bring peace, but bring the sword. So when we are a reflection of Christ, so, and they can see themselves as being wicked, evil, sinners as they are, as we were too, it's discomforting to them. Oh, yeah. It's discomforting to them. So, you know. And Jesus did say that don't don't get all upset. They hated him first. And they will hate us. Uh, but not everybody. You know, so just realize there are those out there that are still searching. Uh, if you, that that's leaning on the thing, that's Angie's. Yep. So, what are some important things that are true of us because we believe in Christ? What's something that's important about you because you do believe in Christ? What's one of the biggest things? Love for others. That's one, yes. What did Christ do when we became one of his? What did he do for you? Saved me. Well, right, but what? Saved you from what? Sin. He forgave you of all of your sin. Without any explanation. We didn't have to stand before him and, and give an excuse. We didn't have to stand before him and he just forgave us. Because he loves us that much. So today we're going to see something that is true of us as believers and that God wants us to realize and also to live by. Have you ever heard this expression? You're dead to me. Or I'm dead to that. What does that mean to be dead to something? Anybody? What does that mean? I've heard people say, I'm dead to that, or you're dead to me. I mean, what, what does that really mean? Anybody else? Sometimes we feel as if we want nothing more to do with some person or situation, so we feel dead to that person. Today, we're going to see something that the Bible tells us that we are dead to. Remember, we're dead to sin. We should not be doing it. Romans 5, Paul wrote about the fact that God's grace abounded even more abundantly than sin. To some of the critics, this sounded dangerous. Well then, maybe we should sin all the more to make sure that God's grace keeps abounding. Paul responded emphatically to this faulty thinking in Romans 6. Who wants to read verses 1 through 11? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not, so, not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So verse 1 contains the objection that critics and unbelievers might raise. Why shouldn't we continue in sin in order to cause God's grace to abound even more? He answers forcibly, no. May that never be the case. Those who have died to sin can no longer live in it. Verse 3 begins to explain what it means to die to sin. The baptism into Christ refers to our union with Christ at conversion. His death for sin brings about our death to sin, and we speak often of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So believers are united with Jesus in faith and know a spiritual parallel in their own lives. 
So through union with Christ, they are dead to sin, buried by baptism, and most importantly, raised to a new way of living. Now, Paul spoke of this often in the passage of union with Christ. It is important that it's a concept worth examining in more detail. Now, we can look at the analogy of political union, for example, the 13 original colonies that broke off from English rule to form the United States eventually formed a constitutional union. When a new state became part of the union, the union's history became its history and vice versa. When Hawaii joined the union in 1959, it also acquired the history of the American Revolution, Bunker Hill, Lexington, and Concord. The Declaration of Independence, the Liberty Bell, and Freedom Hall all became part of Hawaii's history as well. Now, Hawaii's history up to that point became part of the larger history of the Union itself. Now, Christ suffered on the cross for our history of sin, but we benefit now from his history of obedience and new life. And we now share our histories through our union with Christ. Now, Paul continued making it plain that union with Jesus' death for sin entails union with a resurrected life. It is as though, or is it, yeah, as though our sinful self died on the cross so we could escape sin's reign. Now, sin always gets its payment, and that's death. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, we know. But once that payment has been made in full, it has no more claim, not on Christ and not on us. It says that we may feel its pull and do battle with it, but it has no legitimate claim on us now that we are united with Christ. We are raised to live a new life. We owe nothing at all to sin. Indeed, just as Christ was raised, so are we. Now, Jesus died for our sin, ours, but not his. Sin had nothing to say to him, nor will it ever exercise a hold on him. Jesus underwent the worst that sin could inflict and came through in glorious life. Even so, we must consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. We must let that reality guide how we think and how we act. We think and live as if we want nothing to do with sin. So we now live to know, walk with, and serve God who has forgiven us, placed us in Christ, and given us new life. Now we no longer answer to the old boss of Satan because he has no legitimate claim upon us, not our actions, not our feelings, our desires, or our thinking. God's grace and forgiveness has changed everything. We are now free to live as forgiven people. Our union with Christ means that we have died to the power of sin and can now live to please God. Think and act like you are dead to sin and alive to God. What's one way to please God? Anybody know? We learned it Wednesday. Y'all forgot already? What was Wednesday's lesson on? <clears throat> Bible says without something it is impossible to please God. What is it? Hey. Oh, I'm going to have to start making y'all take quizzes. Because that's telling me y'all ain't paying attention on Wednesday. And else is going to have to help me write up a quiz so I can start making sure people are paying attention. <laughs> Everybody's like, we were here Wednesday? We had something on Wednesday? So what does it mean to be dead to sin and alive to God? What does that mean? When you hear that, to be dead to sin and alive to God. You don't know part of it anymore. Right? What does it mean to be alive to God? Obey and serve him. You want to obey his will. Yep. What does the song say about being happy in Jesus? What do you have to do? It's two things. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. <laughs> But there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So how does our union and identification with Christ affect our relationship with sin? How does it affect it? In favor to sin no longer rules us, and we have a choice to say right. no to temptation. God gives us a choice. Just as he's given the angels and everybody else that he's created, he gave them choices. Anybody else? Hey, 
Y'all you know, quiet this morning. I hope that's not how the service is going to be today. That scares the pastor. It says here, um, it says here that, well, do you not know that the body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. We were bought with a price. What was that price? The blood of Jesus. Wow. So we are not our own. I mean, and it's not that you're being controlled like a robot. God gives you a free choice. But this is what I tell people. If you become a Christian and you're truly born again, then the Holy Spirit resides in you. Okay, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed. The thing is, is the Holy Spirit's job is to draw us closer to Christ and convict us when we're wrong. So if you're not being convicted for doing something wrong, then maybe you never got the Holy Spirit truthfully. And I, and I, I'm like, y'all know that I'm taking classes online through Warner and that's a, it's a Methodist college. So I have to keep my filter on, not saying anything's wrong with the Methodists, but some of their beliefs don't line up with what I believe. Um, and one of our discussion posts classes that I took a while back, they were talking about how everybody is born from day one with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit don't get activated till you get saved. And I'm like, that is not true. <laughs> it's not like the Holy Spirit's a switch. You go, okay, it's yours now. <laughs> Christ said that the Holy Spirit will be given to you when you become one of his. So the Holy Spirit is not with us all the time until we get saved. Once we get saved, Holy Spirit's in you. That's why there's no way you can be demonically possessed as a Christian. There is no way. With the Holy Spirit residing in you, no demonic spirit is going to reside there. He's not going to give up residency. He's not going to allow a roommate to come in. It doesn't work like that with the Holy Spirit. Now, you can choose to kick the Holy Spirit out. I believe that in my heart. You can choose to walk away from God. You can choose to say, I don't want to have no part. Because if that's not the case, then why did God put in the Bible that it is impossible for those that have once tasted the goodness of God to be able to come back? I mean, think about it. We have a choice. Don't. Do, I mean, Judas made his choice. He walked with Christ for three years. was one of the closest to him. He chose to deny him and chose to rebel against him so yes we all have a choice and that's why i mean because if you think about it when jesus talks about in the bible that nothing can pluck you from his hand nothing can he is right nothing but you you can walk away now there's a lot of a lot of different and i'm not saying religions or whatever there's a lot of churches today that believe once saved always saved that you can get saved, live however you want to, and you are going to heaven. Well, I've not read that in the Word of God nowhere. I haven't. Because the Holy Spirit ain't going to let you do that. If you're truly saved, you're going to be miserable if you're not living right. And if you try to come to church with sin in your life, you cannot sit comfortably in church. <laughs> you can't do it. I preached the message a long time ago. And uh, I used... I used, the first time I preached it, I used my son as an example. When I preached it the second time, I used a gentleman, uh, Mel, that I used to go to church with. And what I did is I handcuffed them, and I put them at the front seat and made them sit there during the message. Now, I'm telling you, if you've never wore them before, they're not very comfortable. They're not made for comfort, okay? They're really not. Um, and I made them sit there the whole time during the service, and I started preaching. Um, and the whole time they're constantly moving, they're doing this, they're trying to get, and I asked them during the service to sit still. Sit still, you gotta be comfortable. You gotta, oh, I can't, what the handcuffs represented was sin. That's what it represented. And where I went with it is I, and I said that, because I put on there a warrant, I think the title of the message was a warrant for your arrest or something. And I talked about how God has a warrant for you to bring you to him. That's what he's wanting to do. And I said, as long as sin is in your life, you cannot sit comfortably. But there's only one person that had a key to those handcuffs. And I said, that person is Jesus Christ. So when I went down and used the key as an illustration and took them off of them, oh my goodness. They're like, oh man, oh that hurt. Oh man, I'm... that's how it is when our chains are broken. 
and we allow Christ to just take over our lives and we let go of everything that has bound us to Satan. You know, you, you, you have this feeling. I've heard people say that when they accepted Christ, I've seen people run up and down, you know, act crazy, jump up and holler. I've seen people just sit still. I know when I did it, it felt like I was just floating in that car when I accepted Christ. I just was just so, like everything, not a weight in this world was on me. I just felt like I was floating. Um, and it's just everybody's salvation experience is different, okay? Realize salvation is not a feeling. It is not on a feeling. But once you get it, you're going to feel something that you've never felt before. And it's when your sins have been forgiven and all your chains have been broken, there's this peace that comes on you that nothing in this world can give to you. I don't care how much money you have and how many places you went to in this world, you cannot find that kind of peace. That only comes from God. And it's one of those things that once we allow God to really have his way in our lives, you will see things change in your life like you've never seen before. The problem is, is we don't give him our all. We just give him pieces because we don't want to give up everything. We want to hold on to some things because one, either we're enjoying it or two, we don't trust God with it. So we got to realize what is it that you still need to give up to get that true peace. And a lot of people don't want to give up this world. They think there's so much fun in this world and there's so much enjoyment in this world. Yeah, there are some things in this world that are fun to do. I mean, like y'all know I go golf and I love to do that. I said, but that's not my world. You know, it's one of those things I can't let that consume me. I can't let it become an idol. If anything takes the place of God in your life, the Bible calls those idols. And if you read in the Word of God, when idols are destroyed, they are ultimately destroyed. And the reason that has to be done is so that you can't have that relationship with God. Because God told us we can't serve both. You can't serve God and mammon. Now, mammon could be Satan. It could be things like we learned Wednesday night. It's anything but God. You can't. you got to have one or the other. You can't grab them both and hold on to them. It doesn't work that way. God is a very jealous God, and he wants full attention. He wants 100% him number one in your life or nothing at all. That's why Jesus tells us that be hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. Because if you're lukewarm, he's going to spew you from his mouth. So we have to realize who or what are we <coughs> allowing us, allowing in. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those things. Now, reading all this, it doesn't mean that when we get saved, we're not going to sin. Okay, that's not what this is meaning. But what it means is we're not going to be attracted to it or that's where we want to stay. It's not going to control it. It should not control us once we get saved. Sin should not control us. We should control it and be like, no, I'm not doing that today. Not today. You know, I'm, I'm going to God today. Lord, can you help me with this today? I'm struggling. Trust me, every one of us have struggles. If you're breathing, you have struggles. Okay, your life's not perfect. Your life's not full of roses and, and everything else you like because we live in a fallen world. We live in a dark place. We're the light. we got to let our light so shine before men so that people will see Jesus within us. Because if we walk around, and, and I've said this many times, as Christians, we cannot walk around looking like the walking dead. We can't. But we do it so much. We walk around so depressed. We walk around with our... You, do you realize, medically speaking, it takes more muscles in your face to frown than it does to smile? That's why so many people have so many chipmunk cheeks. Because <laughs> they've worked them out and they frown so much that they just... Like they're hiding food, waiting for winter or something. It takes less muscles to smile in your face than it does to frown. That's medically proven. So, I mean, hey, take it up with science. God created us. So we are to be joyful. That doesn't mean you're always going to be, but strive to be. Okay? God will help you. If you're depressed, eat pizza. It will always help you. <laughs> always. You get every food group in one slice. So you're good. See? Anybody got anything before we? I don't even know. We're not going to get through this. And I ain't going to apologize either. Because I do what God says. Amen. But like the next one, I mean, I'll read it. We're not going to get through it, but I want to read it because it kind of goes along with what Nelson was saying earlier, how, you know, we're not, we're bought with a price. 
It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your members unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. That's what we have to remember, is that we're under grace. But that doesn't mean you treat his grace carelessly either. And you say, oh, well, you've got to forgive me. Just go ahead and do it. Can't do that. But we do, if we're honest, we are creatures of habit. We are creatures of sin. But when you become a new creature, that's where the battle begins. Remember what the Bible says, that we don't fight against flesh and blood or we're not supposed to. We're supposed to fight against spirits and principalities. When you get saved, your spirit wants to overtake your flesh. Your flesh is not going to let it go very easily. So you have to die daily. We were talking about this Wednesday. Paul says that we have to die daily. He doesn't say to the spirit, to the flesh. Die to the flesh daily so that the spirit... And listen, what you feed the most is who's going to overtake. Okay? Some of us have some skinny spirits walking around here and some fat flesh because I have fat flesh, but I don't feed it like I do my spirit. I try to feed my spirit a whole lot more. That doesn't mean at times that my flesh doesn't take over, but that's where it's my fault. I can't blame it on, oh, Satan did it. No, he didn't do it. He don't get that credit. It was our choice. Satan can't make you do anything. You choose to do it. So you have to say, I'm not going to do this today. Lord, help me with this today, Lord. Help me to get in your word and read more. It said, like One of the things here says, believers are no longer to let sin rule over them. We are to use our bodies as tools that God can use for righteousness. Listen, you have to remember, God can only use a vessel that's worthy. Whether it's a vessel of honor, you know, vessel of right. He has to use a vessel that's, he can't use somebody when they're not living right to go tell somebody else they're not living right. You know, he can't use somebody that's not close to God to try to bring people to God. He wants to use a vessel that's worthy, but he wants to use a soldier that he can trust. You know, he, he wants to know that he's going to trust you, that you're not going to, you're not going to turn on him. You're not going to stop doing for him. Um, we must surrender to God daily. Listen, if we don't do, if we do not surrender to God, we will end up surrendering to the pool of sin and temptation. You're only going to serve one or two people. And you can't do them both. It doesn't work that way. And we have to realize, listen, none of us are perfect. Uh, we are never going to be perfect till we make it to heaven and get our new bodies. But we can practice. We can strive to be. You say it's impossible. No, it's not. Do you realize there was another person in the Bible that was perfect other than Jesus? Does anybody know who that was? Job. Job. Perfect and an upright man is what the Bible called him. Perfect. But look what happened to him. And the Bible still said he was perfect. Why? Because he stayed close to God. When I have pain, a lot of pain, I try to think of Job. Lord, if I can just hold on. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of us have experienced what Job's went through. None of us. And, and, and if we say that we do, we're, we're, we're doing a disservice because we did not. But if you read Job, what he did every single day is he started it off with the Lord. Every morning, it says he rose up early, went and prayed for his kids. He even lost all of them. But then at the end, he even got more in return. I mean, it's one of those things that we got to realize God allows things to happen to bring us closer to him and to help others that might go through the same thing that you just went through. It's not just, God's not out there playing a game with us. Oh, who can I get today? Hey, let's get that one, you know. That's not God's way. Because God loves you more than you can imagine, more than any preacher can preach out, more than any singer can sing out. I will never understand the love of God. Because it's so great. It's it's higher than me. It's it's something that I, I always ask myself, 
Why me, God? Why did you choose me? Why do you love me when I'm a sinner? I never will understand that until I get to heaven, but I'm thankful for it. You know, it's one of those things that when it says, for God so loved the world, that little word so means so much that we'll never grasp the true meaning of it. But God's allowed us to grasp enough to know that he loves us. You know, I mean, you think about it. He knows you better than yourself, and yet he loves you. You know, he knows what you're going to do tomorrow, and tomorrow's not even here. He knows what you're thinking right now. Man, this guy ain't shut up all day. He's been talking the whole time we've been in Sunday school. I ain't had a chance to say nothing. I gotta go potty. Y'all gotta let me go see. God knows what y'all are thinking. Twelve o'clock, people start doing this in the church. Huh. And it's like, God knows what you're thinking. And yet he still loves you. And me. Can you believe that? I, I'm thankful for it. I ain't gonna lie to you. It's one of those things that... Uh, so we just need to realize, put God first. Do the best you can to let him have supremacy over your life. Uh, and you'll, I'm telling you, you can't. If you just give in to God and quit giving in to self, things will change. You'll see some things change. Every one of us are struggling and going through things, but God will take care of you. You have something else? Yeah. Uh, we have... We don't have the time, but we do have a few things that have come into the church in the last 40 years. Uh, psychology, self-help programs, of taking steps 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 12.4. And Jesus said, whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. Either I can believe it, like the pastor said, we were talking about faith on Wednesday. Either I could believe Jesus, or I could believe all these other teachings that were not taught by Jesus. You know, sin will take us further than we want to go, keep us longer than we want to stay, and cost us a whole lot more than what we want to pay. So, let me read one scripture here. Uh, For if they have escaped the defilements of this world by the knowledge of the Lord and our Savior, and our Savior Lord Jesus, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness that having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. A saw, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. This is the power of sin. And you know, we had, like Pastor was saying that on Wednesday, we have we had a hellstone, brimstone, fire preachers in the old days. And Pastor was saying that today uh, that might be a hard preaching to do. It might not fly with the society that we live in. Because the society that we used to live in before knew about right or wrong. And they have great areas. The society that we live now have great areas. But the greatest concern is not the society and the world. Because the world always been the world. The world will always conduct itself as the world. They are under the power of the wicked. Their father is Satan. I don't I, I don't say that the Bible says that. We don't we don't like to we don't like to sometimes. We like to be kinder, gentler, and nicer than who Jesus was and who Paul was. And we have become, we have, a, we have a, allowed in our churches, and I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about church in general, a friendly seeker gospel that will not change a life, that will not transform. Because in order for a human being to have and experience the transformation of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they must first be told the law. 
the law will induce us to Christ because it will show thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not have other gods before me. Honor your father and your mother and so on forth. This commandment shows where we fall. Therefore, we need a Savior that will reconcile us unto God. All right. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm going to read one more <clears throat> verse with you. Huh? This is <clears throat> dealing with what you just mentioned earlier about you know, how sin wrecks people's lives and how God is loving towards everybody. And Peter. In 2 Peter uh, 3, verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but the Lord is long-suffering towards us all, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God, you know, God is saying, I don't want anybody to perish. You know, he's left the door wide open for us to come. But again, we have to make that choice. That's right. Yep. Yep. So God does not send anybody to hell. We do it ourselves. We choose it. So when somebody, when you hear somebody say, "Oh, God ain't gonna send anybody to hell," they're right. You send yourself. Okay? Because hell was created for the devil and his angels, and that's it. They were not created for us. But when people deny Christ, that's the punishment, and that's rightfully so he died for us you know there has to be some kind of punishment if you don't accept him he died for us took our place on the cross that was not created that cross was created for you and I uh, like when Michelle sings that song he grew the tree that one day he knew would be used to make the old rugged cross I mean I'd have burnt that tree down if I knew my son <laughs> had to be put on it you know but God grew it watered it nourished it knowing that his son was going to die on it so yeah, there is punishment for denying him, but don't don't do it. So, Lord, we just want to thank you again for letting us be here this morning. Lord, thank you for Sunday school. Lord, this this just prepares us, Lord, for worship. Gives us an insight more into your Word. Lord, help us as we go into your worship service. Lord, again, I pray that the Holy Spirit would show up and show out. I pray that you would take control, take charge, have your way, Lord. And please, Jesus, I pray if somebody is here lost you would draw them to you by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we ask all of this in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.